All right, are you ready to get started with the Crafting Interpreters Book Club? In this video, I'm going to cover the whole part one of the book. Uh, again, the book is divided in three parts. Part one covers, you know, about the book, how the book is formatted, but also the main concepts, an overview of the main concepts, and an introduction to the Lux language. And in this video, I'm going to cover the whole first part. The first part also has an exercise uh, that asks the reader to create a hello world in Java. Since I, we are not Java people, I'm going to go over how to set up a basic Java application, how to do the hello world, but also going a little bit further in how to set up uh, a Java application that will be useful for part two of the book. I'm not going to follow the same uh, format of the book, the same structure, so I'm going to deep dive straight in the language first then I'm going to talk uh, about the high-level aspects of what it takes to make an interpreter uh, and a compiler. Again, the idea is that you watch this video first and then you go read the chapters. This video is going to be a brief glance, a bit brief overview to prepare you to read the book so that when you go read the chapter, some concepts are more fresh in your heads, there will be a little bit of repetition and that's going to aid learning. Cool, let's deep dive writing the Lux language. So uh, I have here this, let me share my screen. I have here uh, some files written in Lux uh, so I can introduce the, the, the features that the language has. And as you will see, it's a pretty damn complete language. Uh, I'm not going to deep dive on the why, on the whys, why this feature is in and not that feature because the book covers that. So it's pretty much a glance. Cool, so Lux has variables, uh, it has strings, uh, and it has a print command. So just to give an example, this is a Lux hello world. And yes, someone created a, a syntax highlighter and color uh, for Lux in VS Code, so you can search for that. Cool, let's introduce first all of the data types that, you, that Lux have, have. Of course, Lux have Booleans, true and false. It has numbers. All of the numbers are uh, decimal numbers, represented as decimal numbers, but you can have numbers uh, in decimal, integer and decimal numbers. Strings. And one single value to represent the absence of value, which is no. This would be in JavaScript, the equivalent of undefined or no, depending on the case, because JavaScript has two of those. So in locks, it's only new. Also, as you can see, double uh, slashes are comments. Talking about expressions, there are lots of things that you can do in the locks language, starting with the basics like arithmetic, uh, arithmetic, I don't know how to say that in English. So you have operators to do uh, some uh, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, you have comparison, like less than, less or equals, more than, more or equals. Uh, I'm using a, a font here that has ligatures. So this character here is actually an equal sign followed by the less than, right? If I put these together, my uh, uh, my font will do the, the ligature thing. Lux also has equality checks, equals, equals, and exclamation equal, again, because of ligatures. This is an exclamation equal. If I put it together, it makes the ligature. Or equals equals. If I put it together, it makes that ligature. So different from JavaScript, and as you can see, it's quite similar to JavaScript, right? Uh, it, it inherits, it follows the C syntax that we all know, like equals, 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 brackets, etc. So it's also ends up being familiar with JavaScript, but the familiarity goes deeper because it also supports closures and other things that we know, first class functions and things that we have for granted in TypeScript. One thing that is different here though, <laughs> for crying out loud, uh, is that there is no strict equality comparison or strict inequality. There's only double equal sign or exclamation equal. If the values are equal, they're gonna say true. If the values are different, they're gonna say false. But values of different types are never equivalent. In JavaScript, if I say one equals equals, right? Two equals, not three. One 
JavaScript will do type coercion and say that this is true. And that's the reason why we use triple equals in JavaScript, because we don't want JavaScript to do that because it leads to more bugs than solve problems. Uh, locks doesn't have those. Also, logical operators, exclamation to negate, and the keywords and and or. In JavaScript, the and operator is that, and the or operator is that. You would do something in JavaScript like uh, this is, let me open a JavaScript file here. Let me set it to JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you do something like if, then, it, or let's just come up with some variables. If user, uh, user equals SEO, and I can use the end operator of double two E signs and the, uh, or, Uh, in locks, there's no, there are no use for these symbols there and and or. And he gives a good explanation on the book, so I'll leave that for you. Uh, cool control flow. You have if expressions again because it it's under the family of C-like languages or derived from C. It has the same syntax with parentheses here and then brackets to group the statements so this is the if branch this is the elf branch and it has two types of loops for loop and a while loop again very similar to what we have in javascript functions so uh locks define functions with the keyword fun which i love <laughs> there are languages that use functions like javascript there are languages that use func uh there are languages that use fn uh, I love that he chose fun. So yeah, this is a function, receives two parameters, prints the sum of them. Uh, now again, as you can see, LOX is a dynamic typed language. There are no type information. I don't say what type A and B are. So I can call this like this, print sum with one and two, and it would return three. And if I pass strings, the plus sign also uh, uh, is also used to concatenate strings, much like JavaScript. So if I say hello, and here I say world, this would output hello world. Another really nice thing about locks is that, is that functions are value, so they can be passed around, much like JavaScript. I can have a different variable here, var print again equals print sum again equals print some. They can be passed as arguments and, and so on and so forth. So much like JavaScript, which leads to the next point, closures. Take a look here. I have this function here, return function. And what it does is, I'm going slowly so that you, you to make sure you're following. I declare one variable, doesn't matter what it does. And I create and return a function. So when I call this function here, what's actually happening is that I'm returning this function here, right? So that's why I can say fn equals this, because it returns this internal function. And that's why I can then call fn with parentheses, because then I would be calling this internal function here. Now, the interesting thing is, from this inner function, I want to print outside. I want to use the variable outside. And the variable outside is declared outside of the scope of this inner function here. Meaning that when I execute this first line, line 11 here, return function has already returned. It's it, it not exists. It doesn't exist anymore in, in, in the memory. Any variables that were used inside here would have been gone. But because locks supports closure, and it knows that this internal function here uses this function uh, this, this variable here, it maintains this variable in the scope of this inner function, and that's what we call closure. Uh, so if I run fn here, it would, it would indeed print the string outside. And the author goes in, in explains in the book why, uh, just to summarize, not only because it's an important feature in a, in a, in a language like this, and uh, it's, it's a powerful thing to have in a programming language, but also because it makes the implementation interesting. Uh, a lot of the 
characteristics of locks, a lot of the features that locks have, are not only create were not only created to make a good programming language, but especially to make creating the interpreter interesting. Uh, so that's why we have closures. To that matter, we have classes as well. There is the, a whole discussion in the book on the merits of having or not classes, uh, but the argument is that it might be the, the 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 new cool thing to be to do nowadays might be to bash on, on classes and and, and object oriented languages. But the fact is that they are daily used by millions of developers uh, every day. Uh, they are extremely popular. And some people do find a lot of value in organizing your code in a way that you have behavior and state coupled together. It, it, it might be useful in some cases. Also, it makes for an interesting, uh, uh, some interesting investigations on how different class systems could be implemented and how this one would be implemented. So for that matter, yes, it has classes. It doesn't have a new keyword, so you can just instantiate a class just by calling it. Constructant functions uh, are called init, and it's there's also an inheritance systems, uh, an inheritance systems or an inheritance system where a class can inherit from the other. It doesn't use the keyword extends. It uses this uh, character here, which it comes from Ruby. He also gives an explanation there. So it, it is a complete language. Uh, here's an example of doing Fibonacci uh, in locks. Again, what drove the characteristics and the features that this language has are how we, are, are what makes for an interesting implementation of the interpreter and what makes for just redundant work. It's much more of the same. Uh, but even though that was the main factor, it, it came out as a pretty interesting language that you could potentially use to do the real stuff. And let's take a look at the main terms that we need to know. And for that, uh, the book create, the, the author created this illustration of this mountain here, uh, which I think it's pretty cool. Let me move a little bit here. So this is what a language implementation looks like in general. Different languages, in different language implementations might have followed different paths because as you can see, there are multiple potential paths that implementation can follow. But in general, these are the, the, the terms that a language implementation has to do. So starting here on the bottom and going up, you can imagine that each one of these processes analyzes your code or what's given by the previous uh, uh, step and transforms it into a higher level uh, representation where the meaning of what you want to do rather than the text that you wrote is what's important. Uh, so at the end, when we reach the peak of the mountain here, uh, the idea is that the, 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 the interpreter, it has a complete understanding of the meaning of what you want to do, not of the text that you, that you typed or how the, te the text were structured, how your source code was structured. So let's take a look here, starting with the source code. So what is the source code? The source code is something right like this, right? It's just a plain text uh, file with some, some, some characters on it. The first step that the source code goes through is called scanning or laxer, uh, laxing, which transforms these strings into tokens. Uh, in other words, it goes, it has an understanding of how the language groups things together. It has an understanding of what a word means to the language, and it breaks it down from simple characters to a sequence of tokens or a sequence of words. Uh, and I have an illustration here. So var is a word, average is a word. The equals is a word, but it's different from the parentheses one because in the language, the equals uh, uh, is what represents, it's, it's an operator, and the parameters is, is an operator to set press precedence. Uh, so that's what the scanning and indexing phase does. It trans transforms from characters into a group of tokens that have different meanings to the language. But it doesn't apply meaning yet, because that's what happens on the next phase. The next phase is parsing, where it transforms the tokens into a syntax tree, where it starts to assign meaning. Uh, so it starts to understand that average is a variable that I'm trying to create. 
and then I have these operations going on, like the division and the sum. I have one literal value, which is the number two, and then other function, other sorry, other variables, min and max. So it creates this tree, and we call this the syntax tree, which represents, uh, uh, as I was saying, a higher level uh, uh, abstraction of the meaning of what you're trying to do. If I go back to the gen to the main photo here, once you have the syntax tree, you can already come down uh, and transform to another high-level language if the, 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 the semantics of the languages match. For example, if I'm doing a compiler, have you ever heard of CoffeeScript? Do you remember that? Uh, CoffeeScript was a, was a language built on, it's a different language that compiled to JavaScript, uh, but it pretty much was JavaScript, a different flavor of JavaScript. It didn't have different semantics. It even had, had completely different features. Uh, there was a one-to-one -one mapping to what you could do in CoffeeScript and TypeScript. Uh, so if I wanted to do a TypeScript interpreter or compiler, uh, I could get to the syntax tree and then immediately go down uh, from CoffeeScript to TypeScript. Now, of course, uh, if I don't want to do that translation to another language, I will go up and the next step would be the analysis. So if you take a look here on the syntax tree that was generated when parsing, I have things like I want to uh, do an addition to this variable min and this variable max that during uh, the parsing phase, I, under I understood them, the, the compiler, the interpreter understood them as being variables. But are these variables in scope? Do they, do they exist? Well, this is what happens during the analysis phase. Uh, do we need to bind these variables? Are they on the scope? And also, if you were a uh, typed programming language, it will also check the types. Do the types of these variables match so I can make an addition, uh, and etc. So the idea is that when I reach the peak of the mountain here, the interpreter or the compiler, uh, it has a high level understanding of the meaning of your code of the meaning of the, what you're trying to do, not exactly the words that you used. And from there, we can start descending to generate machine code or byte code. Machine code is the simpler to understand, right? It's transforming that into zeros and ones that can run on, a, that can be executed on a specific processor on a specific operational system. So I can compile, for example, to Windows on Intel. Uh, and that's it. If we try to run on a Mac, it's not going to work. There is an alternative, and by the way, I'm skipping here the optimization phase, uh, which includes taking a look at contests, constants, and see if the value doesn't change, you can put them in place. You can read up more about that in the book. But there's another way uh, uh, besides machine code, which is compiling down to bytecode. And that's very interesting. Uh, also not a, a new technique by any means. Uh, and the idea here is that if instead of targeting one specific processor, what if you came up with an idea of processor that contains m things that m most processors can do? Uh, same for OS. What, what if it creates an idea of, of things that all OSs might want you to, to do? If we create this reference of uh, uh, if we create this reference implementation of this system, we can compile something down that work on the system. And then what? Because of course this system doesn't exist. It, it's, if I go to get this program try to run on my Mac on, uh, and, and uh, Apple processor, it's not going to work. Well, but then you have virtual machines. Uh, that's what happens with Java, for example. That's how Java works. And languages on the .NET family, like C Sharp, when you compile them, you don't compile to zeros and ones for that uh, uh, processor. You compile down to an intermediate representation uh, to this bytecode that, that targets this non-existing system. If you take a look at the bytecode, it's not human readable. Uh, by, of course, any human can be, but it's not supposed to be human readable. And to execute then, you have to execute, you have to have a virtual machine running in the system that will do the translations to the actual processor and the actual version of the system. So yeah, that's it. At a glance, the book goes into many more details. Uh, it's a super interesting uh, read. So let's let to go do that. Uh, now, one of the chapters in the part one of the book, it asks you as an exercise to create a real hello world in Java. Uh, and because I'm assuming we are all JavaScript developers, uh, I'll take a, a moment to, to talk about that. So I want to create a new folder here, Java folder, and I'm going to call it 
uh, or Java hello, and I'm going to call main.java. If you're going to edit Java files, can you use VS Code? The short answer is yes. You have to install uh, an extension so that uh, Visual Studio Code understands Java. So view extensions, and I have here Java, there you go, Java language support. And then VS Code will be able to understand Java. You also have this uh, extension package for Java, which installs a bunch of stuff. I didn't really install this one, I just install, installed the language support. And that's all. That's that just assured that it's going to understand that this is a Java file and do some syntax highlighting. Every Java uh, file starts with a class. It's a object-oriented programming language. So public class, and I'm gonna call it uh, main to keep with the name of the file. Uh, next. There is one special function that Java will automatically call if you're invoking this program uh, from the command line. And that's a static function called main. I'm going to copy and paste here, uh, and it looks like this. In Java, every class has assessors. Uh, so you have something like public, could be private, and etc. Uh, it also has this modifiers uh, static means that this is a class method and not an uh, instance method. This method returns void. If you use to TypeScript, it's the same thing. It's not returning a string, it's not returning a number, it's not returning, it just does side effects. The method itself, the function itself, it's called main, and it receives as arguments an array of strings, uh, which will be uh, the, the parameters that the, 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 the person typed in the command line when invoking this Java program. Because I just want to say hello world, I'm just going to go on and say, System dot out dot and then they have some options here. They have print and print line. Print doesn't do a, a new line at the end, so I'm going to use print line and hello world. What are you complaining about? Uh, probably meaning the missing the package declaration. So I'm gonna say I think I can compile without the package. Let me try. Uh, now, to compile and execute, uh, I just told that uh, Java is a bytecode based language. It, mean, it means it needs a runtime uh, to run your code. So go to oracle.com slash Java and download, or just Google Java uh, Development Kit, JDK. Download it, and that's going to give you a bunch of stuff in your command line, like uh, Java, let me do a dash dash version here. And this is the runtime environment. That's what we use to run Java programs and Java C, which is the compiler. I can try to go to uh, Java hello and do a Java C main main, <laughs> main Java. Ah, there you go. It generates a bytecode interpretation. To run this, I can go and use Java main. Uh, I think I don't have to type dot class, I just type main. There you go, hello world. Now, let's talk about some common things that happen in the Java uh, uh, ecosystem, in the Java roles. Let me delete this for now. The first thing is, uh, you notice that it's complaining here because I didn't do a package declaration. So, you know how in JavaScript I have npm packages and I can install these packages? Uh, that's the same for Java. I can have different packages and etc. But Java expects you to declare the name of the package uh, when you print the file. And it expects you to do so to namespace things. So you can have two packages with the same name, but two different namespaces, and Java will understand that they work uh, independently. Uh, to do that, I type package and whichever name I want. The, the, the package name needs to represent me, so that your package will have a different name. I could use my name, but that's not very unique, right? You, there are other Casio persons in the world. 
So uh, uh, the, the pattern in the Java world is to use a domain name. Uh, get a domain name you want because then you want it's yours. You can prove that it, it it's that that's yours, uh, and then type it as the package name in reverse. So my name, my suppose supposing I had a domain cassiozen.com, my package would be com.cassiozen. It's not going to go and check if you actually have this domain. It doesn't even know it's a domain, but it's a common practice in the Java world. Now it's complaining because it needs to leave in uh, uh, the folder structures needs, needs to match the package name. So let's actually transform this a little bit better. I'm going to create a source folder. In this source folder, I'm going to create uh, the home. And in the com, I'm going to create Casio Zen. And then I'm going to move this file here. Whoa. So yeah, it's it's complaining because I'm 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 not loading it separately. So let me do the following. Let me blah, 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 blah. Let me find, let me open this on a new VS code. Is that it? Perfect. Good. <laughs> now, as my project grows bigger than one file, uh, I would start having, <laughs> calling the compiler by hand. Uh, it's going to get more and more complicated because I have to pass more and more and more arguments. Same for executing, I'm going to have to pass more and more arguments in the command line. Uh, in the JavaScript world, uh, we fix this, we, we've solved this problem by using, by creating scripts in our package.json. Then we can just do npm start. And the whole thing is inside package.json, which defines what does start means. There are a bunch of build systems for Java, like <coughs> Ant, Gradle, and a bunch of others. Uh, but there's a build system that exists before Java exists with one of the oldest build systems ever used by C and many other languages, which are which is Make uh, and works based on what's called Make files. Uh, it's just a system for creating uh, scripts to build stuff. The author suggests us to, to, to use a Make file. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it Make File. The structure of a Make file is uh, you create a task, like for example, clean. Uh, and then you just type all of the comments that go in, the ta in this task. Uh, you can create variables so you don't have to repeat yourself. Uh, and I have a very, very bare bones make file here that I'm going to copy and paste. So let's take a look. I declare three variables here. The source directory is the source. The build direct, the out directory, it's going to compile the compiled files will go with build classes. This is my main file in this package uh, with called main.java. And these are the tasks. Clean, which just removes uh, all of the classes from the build folder. <coughs> Compiles that recreates the classes folder and calls Java C, the Java compiler, and run that runs by also passing some, some, some comments, additional comments. I also have uh, uh, all tasks that run clean, compile, and run in order. And I have this phony call here and the make, uh, make file just to indicate that these are commands, tasks, and not they do not correspond to existing files. With that, I can go to my command line and I can say make compile. If I refresh here, I should have a build folder with classes and the main package. I can also say make run. There you go. Hello world and make clean to delete the files from the build folder. Or just make, and it's going to run the first of the tasks, which is all, and it's going to do everything. Clean, compile, and run, and here's the hello world. So that's it for part one. Uh, read the chapter. Again, I want to hear your opinion. I want to hear uh, your observations uh, about the book, the things that you got stuck, the things that you find uh, that you found interesting. So to participate on the discussion, go to flipgrid.com/slash Cassio Zen.